Well, hello and welcome. Well, COVID-19 has brought us a lot of firsts. And for some, the COVID-19 era may have been the first time that many may have and are still currently experiencing anxiety. And of course, children making up a large percentage of this uh, category, of course. Well, you know, there's a well-known quote that says, our anxiety doesn't, does not come from thinking about the future, but from wanting to control it. You know, in life, we can't stop the waves, but we can definitely learn to surf. <laughs> and we can't change, you know, what we've been through and are still going through with COVID-19. Um, however, we really can change our per perception of it and choose to look at the events and the situations from another point of view. And that being, you know, really what have we learnt from living through this pandemic so far? that can really help us to benefit our lives. Um, and so lucky for us today, we're joined by our special guest, Sarah Smith, dietitian from Bayside Dietetics, who is going to talk to us about what we can learn from our COVID um, anxiety and how it can help us and our children to be healthier. And just a little bit of an intro about Sarah. She works at a private practice in Bayside, Melbourne, after working for an extensive period within a Monash Children's Hospital. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, Rachel. I love your analogy about surfing these waves. Yeah, <laughs> we can't stop the waves in life, but we can definitely learn to really? surf. So I in, like that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we just hear, hear that sort of saying time and time again, it's just life is not going to change, but our perception of it um, and the way that we look at it um, definitely can change and, and, and just, you know, just make it easier, I guess, to sort of to get through, mm. to get through life. Um, yeah, that's it. But, you know, with regards to anxiety, they say also, I guess, the greatest weapon we have against it is our ability to choose one thought over another. Um, so with regards to anxiety, I guess, and, and COVID anxiety in that, you know, like, what are your thoughts about this, I guess? Mm. Um, it, it's a great question because you, you're so right. It was, it was the experience for a lot of us at the first time of the anxiety, or maybe it was worsened for the first time and for and a lot with, with children. And um, I, my specialty around anxiety is the relationship to, to food. And I certainly know when you relate anxiety to food that you can, you can make short term choices that give you relief from the anxiety in the moment. They feel really good in that short term because you get that sense of relief or you can make choices that confront the anxiety. So a little bit harder to sit through in the moment, but they more align with what you want to want um, for the longer term. So I, I think it's, it becomes really relevant around food in terms of um, short term versus long term decisions. Yeah. And look, of course, we're not discouraging, you know, the struggles and hardships that many households are living through at the moment as well. Um, and, you know, there is a lot that I guess lots of households are going through, I guess, with their anxiety and all that sort of stuff. But, mm. you know, you know mm. with, with, with this, I guess, at some stage, and as you mentioned in your article, which we'll speak about in a moment, of course, you know, putting ourselves onto a positive path really can start with something as simple as just, you know, shifting our perception and seeing lessons um, in this COVID era, um, you know, from, from a different point of view and, and using all of this, um, you know, for good for our families and for our children. Mm. Um, so I'd love to know what are your thoughts on, on this, like taking all of these lessons and actually doing something mm. with them as opposed to just saying that was, you know, and, and this is because we're still, mm. you know, let's face it, mm. you know, a really challenging time. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that using our flex ability to change our brain to actually learn from the situation, I, I agree with. And hopefully with the discussion that we're talking through today, it's, it's um, learning in a way that will actually help parents and people feel really quite settled and calm again around food. It, it's not a complex thing we're going to talk about that is really hard to do. This is just helping, um, you know, reassure parents um, give a bit more information and, and reassurance to help uh, the job be easier really around kids feeding nice nice so on that <laughs> we published your article titled learning from our anxiety around COVID-19 to help us and our kids be healthier so for someone who hasn't read the article yet could you please give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it Mm. I um, put my hand up at the start of the article to going and really seeking toilet paper in, in abundance <laughs> when and we had that threat of not enough toilet paper. That madness um, that we lived through. That, that <laughs> madness that, um, you know, not many sort of missing, but, but I did. I went, and when we got that toilet paper that um, just in, the just in case toilet paper, 
And what I wanted to do was, was link that to how that can play around, around food so often. So COVID-19 brought out these beautiful examples that happened with toilet paper. It happened with pasta and some really random foods that we just really panicked. Flour, we I think, was another one. Enough. People couldn't like, buy flour. It. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Crazy. And... But it was to use that information from that and our sort of um, a really normal human instinct that came out around doing that behaviour and saying, hang on, that, that might play out around food at home too on an everyday basis and it might play out for your your child. So um, I suppose I wanted to do it with the, that little bit of humour and a little bit of information because I think the best way to approach this is, is to be able to understand that human instinct can, uh, it can be really helpful, but it can also have some some negative consequences and being able to laugh at ourselves and learn from it is it can be a really helpful thing to do yeah definitely and of course as a dietitian you've naturally used the analogy of food and its relation to COVID anxiety which is a very natural mm. thing as well so I'd love mm. for you to explain a little more about this um, philosophy and how does the concept of not getting enough to eat do the very opposite and drive us to overeat could you explain a little mm. bit about that philosophy yeah sure it's uh, you essentially if, if you were in a very natural relaxed calm state the what you would do around food if you didn't have any sort of emotions going on if you just had the the physical your physical self around food what you would find yourself doing is eating when you're hungry and stopping eating when you are full and the most natural example of that is infants. Infants who don't have anything else going on in their lives apart from just seeking contentment will be able to um, respond to their hunger and their fullness really appropriately. But what, um, what can happen is a whole lot of various things come in and there's a whole lot that we, we, uh, we talk about, Rachel, in these sessions. But the one I really wanted to bring in to talk about today was if on top of the layer of... Um, hunger and fullness uh, natural instinct if we bring in this fear that we're not actually going to get enough food we're going to switch from using our natural cues in a really calm and relaxed way to actually going to a bit more of a stressed state around food which is going to drive strong food seeking behavior so all of a sudden we're going to not worry about whether we're hungry or whether we're full we're going to go and seek food because we're worried that we're going to run out of it so we can uh -huh. actually overeat we can undereat too but it's actually really normal to overeat in response to that and and have more to eat than we need because we've got we're not engaged anymore with hunger and fullness it's about trying to beat the fear of not getting enough okay so let's really deep dive into this at the moment so mm. in this example or is the example of panic buying and how people were stockpiling the correlation and demonstration of human and like behavior of, of anxiety and how we have demonstrated this recently in the COVID-19 era. Like for example, people were so anxious they were not going to have enough stockpiled in their, in their cupboards and in their fridge. They mm. went and overpurchased what they needed mm. stockpiled. So it's the mm. same as if someone thought, if they were going to run out of food, um, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't sure when their next meal is going to be that they, they sort of mm. overeat. So it's, I guess it's a very primal defense mechanism as a, mm. like a pr protective measure, I guess, for surviving periods of famine when we were cavemen and cave women, I guess, you know, it's like our subconscious mind, uh, it's like our subconscious minds drive us to maybe increase like body fat storage and to gain weight, not knowing we're gonna, when we're going to have our next meal, almost like an insurance <laughs> against the risk of, um, you know, f like failing to sort of to find food. But, you know, I guess mm. we're not cavemen and cave women these days. You know, it's, it's 2020 <laughs> and we're just living through a global pa pandemic and we're just trying to protect ourselves from, from catching it. So is this what you're talking about? Yeah. That correlation. Yeah, I think you've actually done a really nice analogy because we, we're not cavemen still, but actually physically we haven't evolved to a huge degree from there in this respect. And what's gone much faster is that our access to food has gone from having to really seek it to now actually having an abundance of food almost all the time. And really COVID-19 was the first time that we really had that threatened again, that we weren't actually going to have enough food. So we, 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 did, we did go back to a lot of our instinctual behaviour that you are spot on. It's, it's purely about survival. It's purely about making sure as humans, we get enough to eat. And so we will do it. And, and probably another nice analogy of, of the human instinct for survival is if you are about to dive underwater where you don't get to breathe regularly, you will suddenly take a big gasp 
of a breath. You won't breathe normally beforehand. You do a bit of an extra, extra breath before you go under in anticipation of not having enough breath when you're under. So it's a really healthy, um, lovely instinct that we have as humans to be able to do that. And you'll do it with water too. You'll do it with food. You'll do it with the things that you need to survive. You will be able to anticipate not having enough and be able to do a little bit of preparation to help yourself get through that patch. Yeah. Okay. So from that, from like an evolutionary perspective, um, Mm. is the ability to overeat and its relation to anxiety and COVID anxiety, not so much of a a psychology or like a, a mental state of mind, but it's more of a physical state and it's to do like with our hyper and hypoglycemia, which is basically if our blood sugar levels are high or low, like high um, blood sugar levels or low blood sugar levels. What I mean by this, I'll explain my madness. (laughs) But, you know, for example, if we have like a high GI breakfast cereal, which is full of sugar, which when you, you know, take the time to read the labels, the majority of them are full of sugar. The large majority um, of us would then, you know, have our blood sugar levels sort of rise quite rapidly and then drop and sort of plummet quite quickly, of course. So when they do by lunchtime, we're starving and we end up overeating to, f- to fill our bellies again. Is this, um, is this a, another another way of looking at it? I guess with overeating, or is it is is it what we were saying before? Just the fact that um, from an evolutionary perspective, that we we, we tend to over overeat because we just don't know when we're going to have that next meal type mm. of thing. Mm. I I think it would sit with more of the evolutionary side of it. You make a good point that you will overeat if you let yourself get too hungry. So if you're having a really highly processed breakfast cereal and by the time you get to lunch, you're actually extremely hungry because that processed breakfast cereal has gone straight through your body and you there's not much left to keep you full. And so you're extremely hungry by lunchtime. You may overeat because you've let yourself get you know, to that extreme level of hunger. But that's probably a good example of actually engaging with hunger and responding to a physical cue and, and using that. Whereas the fear of not getting enough food is more about not having any awareness of that, that hunger level and actually um, overeating just purely in anticipation of not having any more in the, in the future. So you might, be, you might be hungry because you've only had a light breakfast or you might have actually had a really wholesome breakfast and be quite full. But irrespective, if you feel like you're not going to get dinner, then you will probably go in and, and try and have some extra for lunch just in case you get hungry at dinner. Yeah. So making this relevant, I guess, to parenting kids, could you possibly then please explain, you know, what are our lessons are in this? And could you maybe explain how trying to stop your child from eating too much can actually backfire and how, mm-hmm. how can it actually make them eat more then? Yeah. So with, um, and I think first I want to say that the parents who do try and help their kids out with how much to eat, come from a super caring place so we, we're talking about parents that are really loving and caring for their children and just trying to help them help them out um, but what it's important to know is is that you can get this this unintended negative consequence of it which is that if you as a parent try and stop your child eating your child can interpret that as a threat to them getting enough to eat And they will then switch away from worrying about hunger and fullness and they will flick to that really strong food-seeking behaviour. Say that again. All of a sudden... Could you just explain that again? Sorry for my simple... Yeah, sure. (laughs) No, no. And and, and, um, my my lack of ability to to put it into great words for you, but it's... If you at a meal time, um, so what I'll go through is a, a sort of a normal state first to, to your new and nice comparison. If you at a meal time give your child food and you let your child eat to when they're full, it will be a quite natural process for them. And all the child's doing at that meal time is worried about when they get full and then they will stop eating. If, however, you are at every meal time on a regular basis, you are coming in and saying to your child, right, you are not, you've had enough to eat, you should stop. And maybe, do you know what, Rachel, probably mealtime's not the best. Maybe it's a packet of biscuits. So, right, that packet of biscuits, you've had two. Two's enough biscuits you, you, you shouldn't have anymore. So as a parent, you're coming in and trying, your ch- trying to tell your child to stop eating something. What the child will do is going to pick up and remember that for next time. So next time that they're biscuit, Tim, they're ready to hear you should stop eating after two. And what they're going to do then is they're going to flick to let me try and beat the system. Let me try and get more okay. than these two biscuits. So I'm going to try and either get them, sneak them, or I'm going to try and eat really quickly. So before I hear mum's words to say stop, I will um, 
I will try and get access to more food. And it just comes back to that, that human instinct to try and beat the system of not getting enough food and interpretation that you're not going to get enough to eat. So hence you will go and seek more food. Okay. Get it. Yeah. The more that we're telling them not to do something as, as, we did it as kids as well and as, as all kids yeah. do. The more you say don't do something, the more they're going to go ahead and do it. Is that what it is? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, essentially. Yep, yeah, essentially. And with food, it comes back to a really evolutionary um, instinct on that for sure. Okay. So this, in fact, is, is the situation then um, that can be setting up a habit of um, children overeating. Is that right? Mm, exactly right. Yeah, all exactly right. Cool. right. So is there, I guess, an alternative approach that doesn't have the consequences of backfiring in this way then? Mm. I mean, I mean, there's going to be scenarios where, for example, the kids are going to be snacking and you know that you've got a nutritious meal and dinner ready, ready for them, full of veggies, mm. but they're sort of maybe, as you said earlier, snacking on processed foods, being biscuits and chips and that sort of stuff. And mm. this is, a, uh, okay, I'm playing devil's advocate here, um, but, you know, so all of a sudden the kids are snacking and it's an, an hour and a bit before dinner and you're going to say, stop mm. snacking on this stuff because I want you to eat your veggies at dinner. So how can that scenario then um, sort of stop the habit of them, I guess, overeating? Or not? Yeah, yeah. Great, great question. And I think you've used an analogy of a really not a really common situation to have. And so I think it's a it's a really great example to use. So the first thing that I would encourage parents to be able to do is to be able to trust their kids' natural instincts around food, their natural hunger and fullness again. And that's where, as I was alluding to at the start, it actually a lot of peace from comes from doing this approach because you, you don't have to try and control your kids' quantities. You can actually sit back and trust your child has got the ability to respond to hunger and fullness just like they did when they were a baby. That, that instinct doesn't go away. So that's going to be there um, within your child still. You've just got to help them find it. And the way you help them find it is by stopping trying to do that job for them. Because the more you do the job for them, the less they're going to practice doing it for themselves, the less they're going to trust themselves, and the more they are going to look for you to try and stop them because they don't know how to do it themselves. So that's, that's the, um, the one big underlying principle of it all. Uh, but that, to relate that to the situation that you, you spoke about, you sort of spoke about the, the child's eating in a snack time, but really the adult wants them to eat at dinner time instead. Yep. It is... It's the adult's role, certainly, um, in the, the household around food, a really nice role for the adult to take is to be able to decide when meals are and what the food is being offered. Right. So if the parent is thinking, hang on, I don't want my child to be snacking now because we're really close to dinner and I've got a nutritious dinner, it's the right of the parent to say, it's not snack time now. Kitchen's closed and kitchen will be, you know, there's dinner coming. And what you're doing is essentially you're reassuring the child that there's going to be plenty of food. So your child is going to get the opportunity to eat. It's just steering the child to the meal that's got the nutrients that you want them to eat from. But then at the dinner time, when you sit down for that nutritious dinner that you described, let the child work out how much of that dinner that they need to eat according to their physical cues and, and don't try and do that, that job for them. Okay. So still still give them if they're hungry and dinner's not going to be for another hour and a half or so two hours or something still give them the opportunity to eat and have a snack but give them the the ability to decide how much they want but so they understand this is a small meal because i'm going to have a big meal later yeah that 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 reassurance is is, yeah that reassurance is really nice to be able to say to a child hang on dinner's coming so there's there is plenty of of food coming um but, but the parent can choose when the snack time is. So for example, coming home after school and having a snack then is usually really appropriate for a kid because it's too long to wait between lunch and dinner. So the child does need to have a snack or it might be, um, you know, if a kid is not at school yet, the afternoon time there, it's a really nice opportunity for a child to have a, a snack time then. But if you're worried that the snack time's too close to dinner, then make sure it's the right of the parent to be able to choose when the snack time is so straight after school get the snack done kitchen closed from there and then let the appetite will build up again before the dinner meal later on in the evening and and if at snack time allow your child to have what that they need to have to fill their their tummies at that time and if you're worried that they're going to have too many biscuits don't offer biscuits offer something else that is that you're more comfortable with them helping themselves to so i'm hearing that communication is a very very big thing and this like rome 
wasn't built in a day. So it is sort of one step at a time. And then it may take some time for parents to be able to maybe, you know, sort of, I guess the kids have, have the children understand this lesson. Would you, would you think maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I do. It, it is also surprisingly quick. It, it, I agree with you that it's, um, you, you need that consistency of a message for a child to be able to have them accept it. However, this actually, in my experience, is a transition that you can do pretty quickly within 10 days or two weeks. You can get the system really sorted, which I think in the picture around food is actually quite a, a rapid period around, around time. So if, if you sort of make the decision as a parent to say, hang on, I'm going to take this on board. I'm going to be in charge of when meal times are, but I'm going to start to trust my child about getting enough to, you know, use their appetite and their fullness to help them work out how much to eat rather than doing that job myself. That's actually a very, very quick, um, if you believe in it and you feel really solid about it, you can do it consistently and you'll find your child responds pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And in your article also, you asked the question, if parents um, on a regular basis are asking their child to stop overeating, let's say Mm. now it's dinner time. So we've done that Mm. and we've moved to dinner time. Um, Mm. And if parents on a regular basis are asking their child uh, to stop um, eating that they should consider observing, I guess, the signs of them starting to overeat. So the question is, should parents be observing if um, their children are eating too fast or if the portions um, are too large also? So could mm. you maybe talk to this yeah. a little bit as well? Th- those, yeah, sure. Those two cues, the, if your instinct is that your child actually is having too much and they're not actually using their fullness cues to stop the eating and they're just continuing past feeling full into a, you know, having too much where they might be feeling a little bit tired after a meal or a little bit uncomfortable in the tummy after a meal, or alternatively, if they're eating really quickly, then it probably is a sign that your child is starting to flick to food-seeking behaviour and is not using their fullness cues. And what you want to do is help them flick back. You want to get them out of that food-seeking zone and just trying to to find food and back to just being able to use their fullness to guide them to stop eating. So what's food-seeking behaviour? So that's the anxiety. So that's the food-seeking is... is, um, is when you're looking for food, even when you're full, because you're worried that it's going to run out. So that's the analogy to the coronavirus. We're looking for toilet paper, even though we had enough in our cupboards because we were worried we're going to run out in the future. So if your child's in that mode where they're just looking for food, even though they're not necessarily hungry for it, it's probably because they're fearing that they're not actually going to get given enough. So hence they are feeling a bit anxious about that and they're going to overeat. And as we said at the start of the chat, this is from an evolutionary perspective. This is something that mm. as human beings that we haven't necessarily evolved out of yet, that we're, that we're still doing mm. this in- instinctively. Is that right? Yeah, but it's a very, I think it's a very helpful thing. Like if we can get back to just the pace of just being able to use hunger and fullness to guide our intake and sure there's a little bit more to it. You want to enjoy your food and you want to, you know, embrace the food available. So it's not as, as, as simplistic as that, but if you use hunger and fullness as a fairly, um, as your, your staple guide to working out how much food to eat, it's a really calm and peaceful thing to, to do. It's very natural to engage with that. And, and this chat's about um, helping parents see whether maybe they're starting to try and do that on behalf of their child, in which case they're teaching their child not to use their own hunger and fullness. They're teaching their child to listen out for their parent rather than being able to do it themselves. Say that again, because that was, that was gold. So if you find yourself trying to stop your child from eating, what you're doing is you're teaching your child that they can't do it for themselves. They need you to come in and, and tell them when to stop food, whereas you want them to be able to go back to trusting their own instincts about how much to, to eat. And so how does a parent then make that transition from one to the other? The big thing, it's a, it's a great question. The big thing is really that you you do trust your child because if you trust your child then they will trust themselves as well another thing you can do really well is role modeling because um i know i experience hearing my kids say stuff that i think is is awful but i I know that i've said it you know two hours earlier that they they just are really good at role modeling whatever you do so if you can role model trusting your own hunger and fullness you can role model not finishing everything on the plate 
You can role model having more when you are hungry. You can role model um, not eating everything inside and just being able to do it a, at a relaxed pace and, and being able to stop with your fullness. Then your kid will pick that up. So if you role model it yourself, if you trust your child can do it for them, for them, for their selves, then you're, um, you'll find that your child will be able to, to, to migrate towards that for sure. And the French do this extremely well, and this is part of their culture. One of our other partners, Marie France um, from Fussy Eater Solutions, speaks about this, and I've spoken to her on a number of occasions. That the French, um, as a family, will go to the fa- uh, to, to the table um, with mm. with appetite and ensure that they are hungry, mm. and they will eat for enjoyment, and they will eat to the mm. point where they feel full. But they don't once they're they 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 sense that their their stomachs are full they don't and they understand the point where they don't then keep pushing and they don't overeat so mm. a they they um yeah they, they they have the enjoyment of eating it's not necessarily mm. just something that they're doing just um for fuel but they they enjoy mm. um you know the fact that they uh, were hungry before their meal. They enjoy mm. the, the, the you know the meal. They and they they know at what point that their belly is full, and they know at that point mm. that they stop. So mm. um, so it, which is an interesting uh, philosophy as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Mm. So that's the same thing. That is beautiful. That's a really nice example of a situation where where parents are trusting their child to to be able to just choose from the food that's available and use their own appetite to, to work out when they're, when they're mm-hmm. full. And we do know from studies that if you take someone, say, from Australia and pop them in France and, and have that sort of upbringing around food, then they will adopt that same behaviour around food. So we know it's certainly learned and it's certainly possible for anyone to get to that. Um, and key things you said there is, is really that um, embracing appetite. So it's, it's, it's really awareness of it and feeling quite comfortable with being hungry because it's it's just a cue that you need to eat it's it's not a panic station it's just a cue to eat and then you go to a meal the meal is where you you wait until you feel full and so you're responding to your internal cues around it and you also mentioned the enjoyment of food and really celebrating that meal so everyone could really sit there peacefully and be able to calmly access those those cues around hunger and fullness you know australia as um such a multicultural uh, country is really a melting pot of so many different cultures. Um, you know, coming from a, an Italian background myself, of course, the Italian culture is that there has to be an abundance of food. And if you don't eat, and then of course, our whole culture is the <laughs> forcing people to, to eat and then overeat. It's completely opposite to what we were just saying about the French, that they know at what point their bellies are full and they've enjoyed their meal mm. and they're not going to have that, that feeling, of, oh, I've eaten too much type of thing as well. Mm. But as Italians, it's really ingrained in us from such a young age eat 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 you know and so it is very much a cultural thing <laughs> i think as yeah, well yeah i love that yeah you know, yep very very different yep. but you know but what i'm hearing um and tell me if if i've heard it wrong but if parents are putting their best efforts into putting the foods that they want their children to eat in front of them um and and, and making those meals as enjoyable as possible really they should and parents should really just let the children decide how much they want to eat and when they want to stop eating um that's now, the perfect summary rachel well said Okay, great. But what if playing devil's advocate again, the child mm. has only had two bites and they're like, I'm not hungry anymore. That's the child's right. You as a parent, you get to accept that and, and just give your child an opportunity to eat again at the next meal. That's why regular meals and snacks are important because your child's going to get regular opportunities to eat over the day. So if at one meal or snack, they just choose not to eat at all, or if they choose to eat, but hardly anything, that's okay. Cause they'll be able to eat more the next time. You're going to trust their body around choosing how much they need to eat. Okay, great chat. I'm really, we've covered a lot. So if you, I guess, to summarise your key messages um, for our audience today, what would they be? Oh, I just go back to what you said a moment ago. That was <laughs> that was spot on. <laughs> so I, I think for, um, for, for parents that there is a, an approach to food that really takes the stress away for them. And, and that is to see your role as a parent to be about providing the food, when the meal times are and allow your child to do the job of, of choosing how much to eat. And if you find yourself overstepping into their zone and trying to control how much they're eating, you will find that they will find that anxiety provoking and you might accidentally cause them to do a whole lot of overeating. So bring yourself back to doing your job and allow your child to do their job and you'll find it really helps for 
nice relaxed meal times, just like the French. <laughs> just like the French. <laughs> well, thanks for talking to us today, Sarah. If, if anyone's got any questions for you and or want to find out more about your practice and all that good stuff, whereabouts can mm. they find you? So Facebook or website, Bayside Dietetics. So www.baysidedietetics.com.au. All right, love this chat. Thanks and, for having um, me, Rachel. Anytime. And I'll speak again soon. Take care. All right, bye. You too. Bye.